Hello, everyone. We're going to get started now. So it's 5.30 on Tuesday, November 19th, 2019, and we're going to call this public hearing to order. So good evening to everyone who's joined us here in Salem uh, and to those who are joining us remotely in Astoria, Medford, and Pendleton. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Consumer Services Division of Financial Regulation, I welcome you to the inaugural hearing on prescription drug prices. My name is Andrew Stolfi. I'm the Oregon State Insurance Commissioner and the Administrator of the Division of Financial Regulation. Uh, the Division of Financial Regulation protects consumers and regulates insurance, depository institutions, trust companies, securities institutions, and non-depository products and services. We're part of the Department of Consumer and Business Services, which is the state's largest consumer protection agency. We're here this evening to talk about prescription drug prices, which are a major concern at a national and state level, which have been a major area of a focus for our governor and our legislature for several years now. To help put our work tonight into its proper context, I want to first share with you all a few short stories submitted to us from the public for this hearing. First, uh, there have been times in the past where I was unable to afford my asthma medication. There have been times where I've had to make my inhaler last longer than it should. I've also done asthma studies in the past in order to be able to afford my medication and survive with drug samples only. Next story submitted. Uh, as a diabetic nurse, I often found my patients would simply go without their diabetes medications because they could not afford them. We had a pharmacy at our safety net clinic that could provide lower cost medications. But even with our lower prices, many patients could not afford insulin and other diabetes medications. And finally, my spouse needs to take Eliquis five milligrams twice a day. A 90 day supply costs $1,343. Again, why so much? My spouse has nine different prescriptions that have to be taken Another cost $400 for a 30-day supply. My spouse is retired and Social Security is only $1,200 a month. I continue to work to receive insurance benefits to cover those drug costs. I cannot retire until my spouse dies. I can't afford to. So these real life stories highlight the importance of the work ahead of us and of the reason for our hearing tonight which is to help unwrap the complex layers of the pharmaceutical supply chain and identify policy options for our legislature to better protect consumers. The first big step was taken during the 2018 legislative session when the legislature enacted the Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act, which established Oregon's prescription, prescription drug transparency program within the Department of Consumer Business Services. Part of that new law directed the department to hold this public hearing on prescription drug prices as well as information reported to the department. And we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what else the law required. So today's public hearing will be moderated by the panel seated up at the dais. Uh, I'll serve as the presiding officer for this public hearing, and I'd ask the other uh, uh, panelists to, to please uh, introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Steiner Hayward. I'm the state senator for District 17, Northwest Portland and Beaverton. I'm also a family physician by profession. I had the privilege of serving as one of the legislators on the task force that was set up by House Bill 4005. I'm looking forward to this hearing. Unfortunately, I won't be able to attend all of it in person, so I'll be here for a while, and then I plan to watch the rest of it online. Good evening. My name's Ron Noble. I'm the state representative for House District 24, which is essentially McMinnville up to Hillsborough, also on the task force um, and um, involved in uh, health care committees and behavioral health care committees and I'm really happy to be able to be here tonight to uh, listen and moderate. <clears throat> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Dana Harganani. I'm a pediatrician and I serve as the chief medical officer for the Oregon Health Authority and I had the opportunity to serve as the co-chair of the task force. Um, my name is Rob Noes. I'm the state representative for House District 42 which is located in inner southeast and inner northeast Portland. Um, I've been in the legislature now for three terms. I'm the vice chair of the House Health Care Committee, and I'm the person that got uh, sacked by uh, Representative Greenlick, uh, which ultimately led to me uh, helping to author uh, House Bill 4005. Thank you. 
I also want to note we're joined in the audience by Representative Prusak, a member of the House Health Care Committee. Uh, and I point that out because tonight is her birthday. Aww. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that when I saw you earlier. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Legislators are a weird breed. <laughs> Uh, so we're, we're going to begin the public hearing tonight with a brief overview of the drug price transparency program and the, some of the data that we've received uh, from Cassie and some and uh, program staff. Following that overview, we've got some invited presenters who will discuss topics such as how a drug is priced from the professional and industry perspectives and on the rising cost of drugs such as multiple sclerosis drugs. During this part of the public hearing, the moderator panel may engage with presenters to ask questions or clarify information. Finally, we'll accept public testimony and comment on prescription drug prices. I'll note for those in Salem, there is a sign-up sheet uh, in the corner over there if you'd like to present during that portion. Uh, and for those in the satellite locations, there are also sign-up sheets. So we do have a limited time uh, this evening and during the public comment period. We'll do our best to get everyone up, but may have to limit some of the time during the public comment period. Uh, and with that, I'll turn things over to uh, Cassie Susi and Antonio Vargas to give a presentation <coughs> on our program and some of the data we've received. All right, good evening. Thank you for being here today. Um, for the record, my name is Cassie Susi. I'm the program coordinator for the Drug Price Transparency Program. Um, and tonight we will turn on our clicker so we can move through some slides. Um, tonight we'll give you an overview of the Drug Price Transparency Program and some of our preliminary results from the information that we've received from consumers, manufacturers, and health insurers. So to provide a brief overview for folks, set a foundation before we dive into our data. Um, the goal of this program is to provide accountability for prescription drug pricing through transparency of specific cost and price information from pharmaceutical manufacturers and health insurers. And this program began um, when the legislature passed House Bill 4005 in 2018, establishing one of the nation's first drug price transparency programs. So there's three main components to the program that make up the primary focus. Um, the first is to receive new drug reports and annual price increase reports from manufacturers as specified by certain thresholds. The second is for health insurers to provide reports with their annual rate filings detailing their top 25 most costly and most prescribed drugs and providing information about the effect of drug costs on premium rates. And the third major reporting component is from consumers. And we want, we want all Oregonians to report to the department when they experience a price increase in their prescription drugs. This is a, an important component to the program and can be reported online by phone or by email. Um, and this, it helps us give uh, confirmation to the accuracy of the reports that we've received from manufacturers and also helps us provide that, that clear picture of what's happening in Oregonians' lives regarding drug prices, um, which is the most important kind of factor of this. So moving into what we learned from our consumer notifications, um, to increase our public awareness and in to inform Oregonians, we've provided outreach to 500 pharmacies throughout Oregon um, and distributed over 40,000 rack cards to try to meet consumers where they're at when they re receive that price increase. Um, so far, we've received some good information from the consumer notifications, and some of the themes that have emerged are um, multiple notices about insulin, prostate drugs, and thyroid drugs. Hmm. Over half of the notices that we have received were for, for brand name drugs. Uh, one person even linked a news article kind of explaining the reason why their price increase went up, and uh, that was due to a recall. Um, and we, can, we further encourage consumers to report to us when they have experienced those price increases or to report um, the stories that they have been reporting about the high costs that they're dealing with. Mr. Chair, can I just ask a quick question? Thank you so much. Um, since I unfortunately won't be able to he be here for Dr. Hartung's pre presentation, and you and I have talked about this briefly, I actually went online to try to report a substantial price increase in the drug that I get for my multiple sclerosis, um, which went from being billed $17,000 a dose to $20,000 a dose between July of 2018 and July of 2019. 
um, which is substantially more than a 10% increase uh, in the course of a year. The problem is the website itself is a little tricky to navigate for reporting a drug that goes under your medical benefit, mm -hmm. and it's a little harder to figure out whether how much I'm paying because it's a little bit different for a drug that you get as part of your medical benefit than your pharmacy benefit. And so I know you guys have put an enormous amount of work into that, and I just want to be sure that people who are paying attention to their drug prices that they may get not directly from a pharmacy also have the opportunity to report because that's a drug that I've now been on for 12 and a half years, and it's gone from being billed 5000 to being billed 20000 in the matter of 12 years, and um, that's well over 10% a year. Absolutely. So yeah. I just, I can absolutely call you guys and send you an email, but some people like to do this stuff at 10 o'clock at night, which is when I tend to do these things. <laughs> um, and it would be nice if you could manage it online as well. So just a, a request absolutely. from a consumer. Um, and as we move into our second year of the program, we're definitely looking at ways we can in, in Prove not only our consumer reporting, but all of the other components as well. And um, particularly knowing that the medical benefit um, is a little trickier to get um, that exact price because it's usually it's reported differently than a retail drug is reported. Right. All right. So moving on to our insurer reports, um, the nine health insurance companies that provide plans to Oregonians on the individual and small group market were required to provide reports to the program as part of their annual rate review process. Um, all nine of the health insurers listed here provided lists of drugs that are most frequently prescribed to their enrollees, the drugs that are, which were most costly to cover, and the drugs which contribute most to the increases in health plan spending from year to year. And they also described the impact of prescription drug costs on insurance premium rates. Um, and so th these are all really important because we know insurance premium rates are affected by drug costs and are increasing. And so this information will help us with that. Um, so it's, again, it's important to note that these companies um, only comprise those who were required to submit health insurance rate reviews. So first we combined the lists from the different companies in order to rank the most frequently prescribed, most costly, and the drugs that were the greatest increase to health plan spending. Um, and these lists did include prescription drugs covered under both the pharmacy and medical benefit. So Senator Steiner Hayward getting to your point about receiving information about all types of drugs that folks are using. Um, these lists did not include any quantitative data, but they were lists to start with. Um, we then worked with our colleagues at the Oregon Health Authority to kind of shed light um, to the amount of money that is paid towards these claims and the out-of-pocket expenses of these drugs, as well as the number of Oregonians filing these claims. This data was obtained through um, the all-payer, all-claims database, which includes healthcare claims and other administrative data from commercial insurers and payers and public payers. Um, all of this data is, the data from APAC is preliminary um, and doesn't represent the entire insurance market. So with that preface, we'll dig into what we've seen with the information. So here we have the top five reported drugs um, that were most prescribed on our lists. We paired that with APAC data to show the numeric value of the claims that um, were received by health insurance companies. So here you can see that hydrocodone acetaminophen, that was our top reported um, most prescribed drug. It's a common opioid, and that was approximately $8.6 million. By comparison, these are the most costly drugs reported by health insurance companies. Um, as you can see, there's quite a big difference on the ones that are most prescribed. The, our top reported one was Humira, and that is close to um, $220 million in claims paid. Um, and Humira is commonly used for rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, and plaque psoriasis. Moving on to the increase to plan spending. Um, so health insurers also reported the, the cost, the, drugs that caused the largest increase to their total spending from 2017 to 2018. And you'll see some of the similar drugs reflected in um, our, the increase to spending list. Just from this angle, is it almost impossible 
So one of the important things to consider is the number of people who filed these claims. Um, and again, this is all information from APAC. Um, so for example, more than 325,000 people filed claims for hydrocodone um, with that amount of 8.6 million of claims paid out. In contrast, Humira was around 6,000 people who filed claims at a cost of $220 million. Um, as another example, um, 3,000 people filed claims for Truvada, which is an HIV drug, okay. at an amount paid of $31 million. And one final comparison to show is for the MS drug Acrivis which is one of the highest increase to insurance plan spending that was reported to us. Um, and insurance companies um, filed claims for $33.8 million for six, around 600 Oregonians. So a clarifying question about that. Acrevis is pretty new to the market. Um, they came in at a price that was at or below some of the other MS drugs. It's the first MS drug to come in there. Um, do we have a sense of whether, I mean, I personally had a conversation with my neurologist mm -hmm. about whether I was gonna switch from Tisabri to Acrevis for a bunch of reasons. I'm curious about whether it's all new prescriptions, whether it's, I mean, do we have any sense? Because you can see it go up either because it got more expensive or because people were switching right. or there were new prescriptions for people who hadn't been on any disease-modifying agents before. Yeah, so um, this is- I just happen to know this field pretty <laughs> yeah. well, this area well, but. So um, like I said, this information is from the All Payer, All Claims database. Um, as we move into the second year of our insurer reporting, we're, hope, we're hoping to get more clarity about the different markets that our insurers, are, the, the drugs fall within all the different markets, and then also the quantitative amounts, which would give light to your question. Um, but based on this information, this is more just to give, kind of give some context to the lists that we were reported to us, um, trying to understand what this picture looks like for Oregonians. Um, but we will be improving our reporting for the second year. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Antonio, who's gonna talk more about our manufacturing reports. Hi, I'm Antonio Vargas. Um, I'm gonna be talking, as Cassie said, about the third major component of our program, which is reporting from prescription <laughs> drug manufacturers. So uh, one thing to keep in mind while we're going through all this is that this is the first time this information has ever had to have been reported by manufacturers. Um, so they're required to submit two types of reports to the program. When they introduce a new drug with a list price of $670 for a month's supply or higher, and they're also required to submit a report when, they, uh, when one of their drugs has a price increase of 10% or more uh, and a list price of uh, $100 for a month's supply. So uh, I should clarify that when we say list price, we're referring to what's known as the wholesale acquisition cost. So this is the starting price of a drug that's set by the drug's manufacturer. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of the data that's been submitted to us in these reports. Uh, this is all preliminary information. We're continually receiving additional information from the manufacturers concerning their reports. Uh, so indeed, once, we, once the department receives a report, uh, it begins a review process during which we uh, request additional information from the manufacturers uh, about their reports to clarify any of, any of the things that have been reported in it. And this process is still ongoing. So we'll start by looking at some of the data from the annual price increase reports. So it's no secret that the United States pays more for drugs than many other countries. The data reported to the program is helping us understand how much more the U.S. pays for prescription drugs. So we require manufacturers to report the 10 highest prices of their drugs in other countries. Uh, this allows us to see where the U.S. price sits in relation. So what we did is, for each report, we compared the U.S. price reported to the highest reported non-U.S. price. 
So the US price generally ranges from half the highest non-US price to 25 times higher the highest, 25 times higher than the highest non-US price. So what this graph shows, that's basically the width of this mountain here in the middle. The mountain uh, shows the number of reports uh, with each markup. So on average, the US price was five times higher than the drug's highest non-US price. So this is the uh, red line you can see in the middle there. It says five times. <clears throat> wow. So there's two blips on the far right past a 100 times markup. Those are for the drugs Medrol, sold by Pfizer, and Onfi, sold by Lundbeck. So let's uh, drill down into this information a little bit. So for example, the median US price, which is the price point that falls in the middle of the US prices, was about $16,000 for cancer drugs. And the highest reported price in any other country for a cancer drug was $13,800 in the United Arab Emirates. So our median is higher than the highest, wow. Right, yes, our median is higher than the highest reported non-US price. And this is typical of the other categories, not just cancer drugs. So for antidepressants, the middle reported US price was just over $1,000. The highest reported non-US price was $470 in Malaysia. So for example, Zoloft is a common drug for treating depression, panic attacks, and PTSD. It's priced at $318 and $1,051, depending on dosage, in the US. And its price ranges from $1 to $470 in other countries. One more for comparison. The middle reported US price for cardiovascular drugs was $580. While the majority of the non-US prices range from $5 to $164. So now let's take a look at some of the reasons manufacturers gave for increasing their prices. So we noticed that the reasons given mostly fell into three categories. Uh, the first was increased costs, typically for operating expenses and materials. Interestingly, manufacturers also reported increased costs due to amounts paid in rebates hmm. and to the use of copay assistance programs both of which can affect the prices that consumers pay. Interesting. Okay. So the second category was market and economic factors, which included obligations to shareholders, lack of competition, and prices in other countries. The third category of reasons given for price increases related to research and development. Many drugs had price increases to fund the development of other drugs. Okay. So another element reported by manufacturers is on their patient assistance programs. Huh. So these are programs which uh, consumers can use to reduce their co-pays or, or other aspects of paying for the drug. Just under half of the drug reports we received indicated that they had a patient assistance program. The reported assistance given by these programs to Oregonian ranged, Oregonians ranged from $101 to $5 million. And in total, the assistance provided to Oregon's consumers was more than $20 million. Uh, so up to now, I've been talking about the data collected in the annual price increase reports. Uh, let's shift gears and we'll talk about the reports manufacturers must submit when they introduce a new drug. So they must file a report within 30 days of introducing a drug. And so uh, for most of the reports, and so far most of the reports in the program has received have been for generic drugs. So these graphs here show the distribution of prices of new drugs reported to the program. And the height of each bar uh, represents the number of reports with a price in that range. 
So on average, we've seen that brand name drugs are about 10 times as expensive as generic drugs. Uh, though there is quite a bit of overlap in the prices, um, both brand name, we've received a lot of uh, reports for both brand name and generic drugs in the range from $1,000 to $10,000. Even for generics? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so these are, um, the threshold is $670 to report, so we're getting okay. the high cost generics that are reported to okay. us. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll notice that there's a large spike in the right in the brand graph. So those are all reports corresponding to a single drug, uh, different um, packaging and dosages for that single drug. Uh, it's Zolgensma, and this has a list price of $2.1 million. What, what does Zolgensma do? It's for spinal muscular atrophy. Okay. So in these new drug reports, manufacturers report factors that influenced how the drug's price was set. So con uh, contributing market factors included things like the number of competitors and the desired discount off of the reference drug. Patient population factors included how well the drug works and how prevalent the treated condition is. And business factors reported included desired rewards for innovation and recouping of costs. Now I'll turn the uh, presentation back to Cassie and she'll talk about how drug prices change over time. All right, so this really brings us back to why we're here today. Uh, this program exists to provide transparency and accountability regarding drug prices and several of the drugs that were, have been reported to our program show significant price increases over time, um, which ultimately affects the amount of money that these consumers are paying over time. So one example, of how a drug price changes over time is Lenvima, which is used to treat different types of thyroid, kidney, and liver cancer. Um, in 2015, the drug was introduced at a price of $12,500. And in 2016, this rose to $13,427. In 2017, there was a, a little bit of a price increase up to $14,000. And then finally, at the beginning of 2018, Lenvima was priced at 15,000. By the end of the year, was $17,500. So to show this in comparison with the information we've received about other countries' prices, um, the highest price in the United States was 17,500. And in other countries, the range is anywhere from 10,500 to uh, $2,400, so there's quite a big range in other countries, but um, all of the highest prices started below the price that this drug was introduced in the United States. Director Stolke, can I ask a question? So, um, Cass, this is super interesting. Um, this drug, is there, um, is there like a generic alternative or a competitive, or comp you know what I mean? Like, a, an, like if I go to the doctor or a nurse practitioner and I want to be treated, can I have a different choice of medicine, or is this the only one in its class that's doing this? I am not sure Representative knows on that. Okay. We can definitely take a look. It would be interesting to know. It would be very, really interesting to know. Um, I'll, I'll make note of that, okay. and we'll, we'll connect back with you <clears throat> on that note. I'm not, I mean, either way, it tells, it'll tell me yeah. something, uh, you know, like, it's like at one level, it's, it's almost price gouging if, there's only, if that's the only thing that's out there that treats this. Um, and then at another level, it's just like if there's other alternatives, I guess I want providers to know that they can prescribe something else. So we'll look into that. But our next example also kind of illustrates um, a, how a price increases over time. So another example is a common cholesterol drug, <coughs> Lipitor. Um, in 2006, it was introduced at $346 in the United States. Um, it steadily rose to double the initial price over the next 10 years. And since 2015, it has steadily increased um, like and is now more than four price. times its introductory yeah. price currently in 2019. So in the United States, um, what was reported to us is Lipitor cost $1,400. Or 1500 um, and then in other countries the range can be from 
what you see, $220 in Thailand to $44 in Sweden. Um, this is all information that was reported to us in our in our drug reports. And was was Thailand the next most expensive? I believe so. Okay. So the data we presented today is preliminary um, because we are still continuing to receive additional information from the manufacturers who have reported to us. Um, and we're continuing to learn how to improve our data quality for the future years of this program. So in summary of um, what we've learned so far is that the US consumer typically pays about five times more than the highest price in other countries of the drugs that were reported to us. The average annual price increase for the drugs that were reported to us is 10 to 20% in that range. Um, and new brand name drugs are significantly more expensive than new generic drugs, um, as we've seen with our new drug reports. Um, and there's several other bullet points, but all these graphs and this information will be published to the program website and will be also included in our annual report that we will be submitting to the legislature in December. Um, one interesting piece of data that, that we also have up on our website is an interactive graph. So we've talked a little bit about these other country prices and we have an interactive graph that shows the median US price and then where the other countries are um, priced at. So you can go online and find that. Um, so this, all this data is just one piece of our puzzle towards understanding the effect of prescription drug costs on Oregonians. And again, we ask the public to submit their stories or their price increases to the department. Um, several of the stories we've received so far spoke of rationing drugs, as um, Commissioner Stolfi iterated at the beginning, rationing drugs to help with people who are breathing with asthma and COPD. Um, this is our first year of the program, so we're looking forward to receiving more information in the coming years and further understanding this topic of drug pricing and the impact it's having on Oregonians. By one thing, thank you very much for this really informative presentation, first and foremost. <clears throat> Earlier you talked about net price increases. Mm -hmm. Imagine drug X. At the beginning of the year, drug X costs $1,000. At some point in July, they increase the price to 1150 which is a 15% increase, right? On December 20th, they decrease the price to 1080 which is only an 8% net increase from where they were at the beginning of the year. And therefore, they wouldn't have to report, right? Even though for the majority of the year, their price was more than 10% above what it had been before. And then on January 5th, they turn around and raise it back up to $1,200, at which point they're still not raising it more than 10% over what it was, but it's gone up 20% over a year before. How does that play out in the reporting process? So our definition of a net uh, yearly increase is comparing averages. So the average for mm. 2018 versus the average WAC price for 2017. Ah, okay. And that's to address that kind of problem that um, could occur, right, like the moving up and down and trying to account for that. Um, so that's what our current definition is for. Thank you. That's reports. very helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. Kesson Turner, thank you. Any more questions from the audience? It's fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so we're now going to move to the portion of our hearing where we'll hear uh, from our invited presenters on prescription drugs. Uh, to begin with, we have Jane Horvath, who's a national expert on prescription drugs. She's going to give us a brief overview of how drug pricing works generally. Then we'll hear perspectives on how a drug is priced and finish with a presentation on the increased cost of MS drugs. And Jane is joining us uh, over the phone. Jane, are you there? Hello? Yes, hi, we can hear you. Okay, I, I have to confess I'm having a very hard time hearing you guys, so. We can hear you just um, fine. Okay, okay, good. So, yes. I was asked to talk um, very briefly about how drugs are priced and then a bit about the supply chain. And so I'm going to move fast because otherwise, I mean, we could spend five minutes or we could spend five hours. Um, but, you know, please feel free to ask questions, okay? So in terms of how drugs are priced, um, in general, I heard what Kathy was saying, or, or Kathy, your colleague, I didn't catch the name. Uh, about how what manufacturers reported 
Um, but, but in my experience, drugs are not uh, priced related to what it costs to develop the drug. Um, one of the manufacturers reported that the drug, the price increase was initiated to support the R&D across the entire enterprise. And, you know, that sort of makes sense. But in general, manufacturers do not price drugs to recoup the price, the cost of developing that drug. And, and if you think about it, it makes perfect sense because it, it may take seven years for a manufacturer to develop a drug to get FDA approval. Um, and they're developing 10 drugs at the same time, and eight of them are toast. They never make it to market. And so what was the point of all that accounting for seven years? You know, and it's not, they're not just developing 10 drugs at a time. There's a lot going on inside the R&D department. So again, they, they just really don't track each molecule that way in general. Instead, and some of this was reflected in the reporting, um, and it's consistent with my experience, which is, you know, that, that they're priced based on the market. Um, Pricing is a lot more a function of market analysis and analysis of sunk costs. And sunk costs would be the R&D. Sunk costs would be uh, the plant, you know, developing and putting together a manufacturing plant specific to the drug, particularly if it's a biologic. Um, and then even advertising can sometimes be considered a sunk cost. So instead, and, and they start thinking, the manufacturer starts thinking about price long before they submit you know, for final approval to the FDA long before that. You know, and they're always looking at the market and the competition. So what is already on the market uh, to treat the disease that this product is, that they're developing is going to treat? And, and, and at what price are those products already on the market? Um, another thing that they would look at is how good do they expect their product to be relative to the competition that is already on the market or anything they can glean about competition that might come on the market behind them. Because again, you know, it takes a long time to develop a drug and you can be generally aware of what other companies are working on Alzheimer's, for instance, or a new cardiovascular approach. Like at that level, it's not like a trade secret. Um, so it, how good is it going to be relative to the competition? Also, what kind of price concessions are the, is the manufacturer going to need in terms of rebates or discounts to get market access for the drug? Um, and again, that's a factor of how many drugs are out there in that space. Um, it, it's all called sort of pricing and life cycle management. Um, it, also, do they expect that they'll get approval over the years for this drug to treat more than one <coughs> illness? That, that also affects sort of their thinking about launch price. How long does their patent last by the time they expect to get to market? A patent lasts 20 years, uh, and in general, by the time a product makes it to market, it might have seven, seven to ten, I think more toward the ten-year mark uh, left on the patents before it can be direct generic, generic competition. And then also, when do their competitors, their branded competitors on the market go generic too? So these are sort of all the things that um, go into pricing and, and it has really a lot more to do with the market than it does with sort of production and development costs. And I would also say that affecting price and price increases has to do with the constellation of other things, but particularly price increases. So are they able to extend their patents? It's increasingly called a patent ticket. And some drugs like Humira, which I think Kathy spoke to as being one of the more costly drugs in Oregon and everywhere else, um, you know, they've extended the patent. I think I read somewhere that they have like 23 years of patent on that product instead of seven. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, once it got to market, it, you know, they've extended it for so, so many times. Uh, also, companies do a lot to gene delay generic entry. They also do a lot, particularly in the biologic space, to delay entry of branded competition, which, you know, the more you can, like, strong arm and use your elbows to keep your competition at bay, the more ability you have to take a lot of price, increase your prices. You know, you have the field to yourself in a lot of ways. And that's what companies try to do, keep the field to themselves. Um, and then there can also be a lot of pressure on stock price. I contend that the industry's eyes are always facing Wall Street. And um, Wall Street is always putting a lot of pressure on the industry, too. It, it sort of cuts. It's a sort of a very interesting relationship, I think. Um, and the other thing about 
ACUS pricing? But just to let you know, you know, obviously we all know, and we stated here a couple times already, that, you know, we pay the highest prices in the world. But with the ex-U.S. prices, the prices overseas are just, there is some nuance to it that I just want everybody to be aware of. So a, a drug in another country might already be off patent. So, and that clearly affects the price overseas. And obviously that's not every situation at all. I'm just saying there are some extenuating circumstances that would explain some of this big differential. Uh, and also companies in general, at least the major ones that I'm familiar with, actually do do pricing for low-income countries, middle-income countries, and high-income countries. Um, that's usually part of the thinking in the companies that I'm aware of. Um, and again, it doesn't explain all of the differential, but to have a, you know, a fair debate, it would be important to know those things. Um, so that's all I was really going to say on pricing. And then, um, it, Kathy, do you still want me to run through supply chain stuff quickly? How much time do we have? I just have a quick question I want to ask her. Yeah, well, maybe I think we have some questions for you, Jane. Is that all right? Okie dokes. Yeah. Jane, right. this is Representative Nose. How are you this evening? I'm doing really well. And you? Not too bad. Um, I have a question to ask you about um, earlier, we were sort of having a, um, an overview of, of what sort of drives up the price, and the manufacturers were revealing some of the things that um, caused the price of medications in the United States to go up. Um, I think I've asked you this once before, but I don't remember your answer, so I'm going to ask it again. Can we eliminate rebates and just say you can't offer them, and then just take that tool out of the mix and then it's just a straight up negotiation on price. And, we're, and is that even a good idea? I mean, maybe that, and is that even a good idea? So, I, my thought, and you know, I, I actually sat down at that time, it, I think it was a couple of years ago now, Representative Nose. Um, I've been at this for I, six I think, years. I don't, think state, I don't think a state can do it. Okay. I, I don't think it'll be effective. Um, because you know the the pricing is set elsewhere. You have PBMs that operate from out of state. I, I will re think. I'll go back and look at it again. But the first time I spent time on it, I, I really thought one state couldn't do it. Now I think the federal government, even though they yanked the rule, that that was going to take us somewhere. Even though a lot of they're people not gonna, had a lot of concerns about they're not going to implement I, that I think rule. It was potentially going to be very effective. And, but I think at the federal level it can be. I think at the state level there's a host of uh, legal and then just sort of market-based issues. I, I, I don't think it would have the effect that you think it would have in the gotcha. state. Gotcha. Okay, thank you for answering. Sure. Any other questions on pricing? Not that you can't oh, wait. Later. <clears throat> Jane, this is uh, Dana Harganani. One more question on the um, piece around rebates and also the drug pricing overseas. Can you just, I know this could be another five hour conversation, but just briefly talk about how does the, um, the price concessions look differently abroad and how big of a difference does that play in the pricing? I honestly didn't hear the question well enough. Could, could you restate it maybe closer to the mic? Right here, here. Trying a different mic. Does that work, Jane? Yeah. Great. The question was just a brief snapshot, if you could, about um, the role of rebates in overseas pricing. Hello. What is the role of rebates in overseas pricing? Correct. Okay. Sorry. I, I just, I, for some reason, so I'm on a cell and I shouldn't be on here. So. It's really interesting that you ask that question. <clears throat> I think rebates are becoming a much bigger deal overseas. And, um, you know, it, it started here as a tool, you know, a market-based tool, and they weren't always quite as applicable to sort of a, you know, a national pricing system. And uh, but, but pharma has sort of figured out, and obviously we can't know anything specific about it because they're always kind of secret, but I'm sort of getting the definite impression, particularly um, Vertex, Vertex actions in Europe have sort of made me realize the sort of scope of what I think is going on. You know, in Vertex with their drug or candy, uh, you know, which was a definite improvement in the 
treatment of cystic fibrosis and right. a very important right. part of the patient. But the price is like astronomical. And um, more and more people are living long, long lives, which is a great thing with cystic fibrosis, whereas most people with cystic fibrosis used to treat stay young, unfortunately. So, but we still have these incredibly high-priced drugs taking on a longer, you know, a, a longer-lived population. Anyway, in Europe, a lot of the government said, not here. Like, you know, we're not doing that drug at that price here. And Vertex, um, you know, really stood their ground. And it took a long time for them to reach accommodation with the National Health Service in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. But they reached accommodation. <laughs> Clearly, there's something going on there. Um, there's some sort of secret rebate. And then, I don't know, maybe three months later, I read that Vertex had reached accommodation with Scotland and the Scot Scottish National Health Service. So I, I do see there's like all these indications that rebates are becoming um, more the status quo in Europe, you know, which is going to make sort of benchmark pricing a lot more difficult. So, and it's going to make the appearance of higher prices in Europe than what they actually are after these super discounts. So, in, you know, we're never, in my personal view, um, to Representative Nose's point, we, we do have to get rid of rebates. Uh, you know, we got to get rid of them, and we have to have a more transparent system, or we're never going to get ahead of them. Well, th thank you, Jane. We're, we're unfortunately running a bit long on time, so we might not have time for uh, you to talk about the supply chain, but maybe I can ask one final question which touches on that and some of the topics we've been talking about. Um, you could you say if there are any differences in the supply chain as we see it here in the U.S. versus supply chains outside the U.S., and if that influences the drug prices as well? So differences in supply chain between here and, and other countries? Correct. Okay. Um, you know, I don't really feel, uh, I'm not an expert in that issue, um, and I apologize, but <coughs> I don't think that there really are. I mean, it just, you know, you need the wholesalers to get the drugs, to take possession of the drugs and make sure that they're distributed. You need repackagers to take these quantities and pack them special for special use, say, blister packs in nursing homes or samples in doctor's offices or whatever it is. Um, and so you need that no matter what country you're in. Um, I, now, if you're thinking about sort of more the financing chain and like insurers and PBMs, I, I am unaware of the extent to which the pharmacy benefit manager business model exists in Europe. And, and, and they may not because the systems are, slight, in some cases, quite more nationalized than they are here and in others. You know, they're run by funds. There's just a lot of different sort of business and government models in Europe that may not be so conducive to the pharmacy benefit management. But the actual moving of the pills around, I think, is pretty much the same. Okay. Well, J Jane, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think it was a good uh, baseline information about the supply chain. Uh, again, thank you, Jane. So uh, at this time, I'd like to call up our, our other panelists, if you can please uh, join us here. Uh, each panelist will have uh, five minutes, and, and please do try to keep to the, to the five minutes to discuss uh, their role or experience and how a drug is priced. And those presentations will be followed up with any questions or discussions from the panel. I think we're following the this order. So there you go. Samuel, you're first. And please, uh, please do introduce yourselves uh, when you first start. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Samuel Pandya. I'm a deputy vice president at Pharma, um, with the Pharma Pharmaceutical Research uh, Manufacturers of America. We're a trade association that represents over 30 of the largest innovative biopharmaceutical manufacturers in the country. And thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. We won't let it take from your five minutes. Thanks. <laughs> we'll yield your time back. <laughs> okay, try it now. 
Very good. Okay. Um, this slide represents, we're talking a lot of, this, but this is a very exciting time in the, in the development of new medicines in this country. There's been tremendous innovation, innovation and advanced, scientific advancements. But we're here to talk about costs, so I want to address those subjects. These, this information on this slide represents information that's been publicly reported by these three entities. Express Scripts and CVS Health are two of the largest PBMs in the United States. Express Scripts covers 80 million, has 80 million covered lives. In 2018, they said that their prescription medicine spending growth, so their costs for drugs, went up by 0.4% once you factor in rebates and discounts that were offered in the system. So their costs went up by 0.4%. CVS Health publicly reported that their costs went up by 3.3% in 2018. CVS Health covers 90 million covered lives. So they, these two are PBMs are primarily uh, prevalent in the pharmacy benefit. They have some exposure in the medical benefit, but mostly it's the pharmacy benefit. The third one you have there is IQVIA, which is the largest data aggregation consulting firm in the United States. They used to be called IMS. And you might be more familiar with that name. They reported that prescription medicine spending net of rebates and discounts went up by 4.5%. Now, IQVIA is capturing pharmacy and medical benefit drugs. This is net of rebates and discounts. These are not numbers that you are typically seeing in the media, and these are not numbers that employers and plan sponsors are experiencing, but these are the, this is the spending growth that, is, that PBMs are publicly reporting. So there's a difference between what they, how much they have to spend, and then there's a, there's a markup, or there's a difference between themselves and what the final plan sponsor, cost that the plan sponsor incurs. This chart is, put, is published publicly by Acuvia. Nothing that I'm presenting here is proprietary to pharma. This tracks price growth. We've talked a lot about prescription medicine pricing um, and price growth over time. The top line represents list price growth. The bottom line represents net price growth. The difference between the two are the rebates, discounts, and other price concessions that manufacturers give to the system. The amount of money that the price concessions that are given are not trivial. In 2018, they totaled $166 billion, which means that in 2018, they said that across all market segments, so commercial, Medicare, Medicaid, everything that's in the marketplace, that the net prices for brand medicines grew by 0.3%. This has been independently reported by Acubia. Again, something that's not typically discussed. We talked a little bit about, in the previous presentations, about list price growth over time and some products that had high list price growth. One of the things that is not well known about our supply chain is that CVS Health has, has publicly reported that over 90% of their brand manufacturer contracts contain a provision called price protection, or it's an inflation protection. That's a stop loss. It basically says to a manufacturer, you, we are gonna contract with you the maximum amount of a list price increase you can take over a period of time, and if you take a price increase above that, you have to rebate the difference back to the PBM. Now, those are provisions in commonplace provisions in PBM contracts with manufacturers, but those, that savings for the, from price protection is not shared with consumers and, and, is, and can or cannot be shared with the plan sponsor, may or may not be shared with the plan sponsor. Depends on the negotiating sophistication of the plan sponsor. Otherwise, it would keep that money. And so that's what you're seeing for the, ver for the various prices that you, you are seeing here. These rebates and discounts that we see in the country, the question came up, you know, where are they versus the list prices in the U.S. versus mm -hmm. other countries? List prices are higher here than they are in many other countries because other countries import, have government price setting, mandated government price setting. But the level of discounting that is happening in the United States is far greater than what's happening in those other countries. There is discounting happening in those countries <coughs> too, off of what their set list public prices are, but it's a fraction of what it is in the United States. This is a busy slide, which I can't get into in detail right now, but this is published in a report that, that Pharma put out in November of 2017. It's called the Follow the Dollar Report. This talks about insulin. This is a lot of what we talked about. The, the insulin's been a topic of heavy conversation about how much patients are having to pay for this medicine. At that time, re, the average rebates that we, we calculated were about 65% in this field. They're now over 70%. This is when the patient's in the deductible. It shows that for a $400 insulin product, the manufacturer retains about $88. The patient pays the full freight, or it's the full amount because they're in the deductible. Right. The, the insurer and the PBM don't pay anything because the patient's paying the full amount of the drug, but they walk away with the rebate that was paid. So this, we feel that what is, what is the situation that you see in this case is the strongest example for why 
Manufacturer rebates and discounts, especially when patients from the deductible, should be passed through to the patient at the point of sale. What I talked to you about before was that list prices, I mean, that net prices are not going up by a hard, large amount, and that spending is not going up by a large amount. But that doesn't mean there's not a big problem in our system. There's a huge problem in our system. And the, the problem is how much patients are having to pay for their medicines. There's been a systematic cost shift to the patient, which is encouraging, increasing their cost burden. There is no reason why a patient should have to pay the full list price of a product when the, when the product's being discounted heavily by the manufacturer. Every one of those entities you see in that supply chain, the, manu to the wholesaler, the pharmacy, the PBM, and the health plan, or at least through the health plan, they make their revenue off of the list price of a medicine for, the, for, the, for a particular drug. So as the list price goes up, they make more. They get a percentage of the list price as part of their revenue which creates a terrible misaligned incentive in the system to see the list prices move because they have, there's a tremendous amount of market power that's there. In addition to the, each of these entities being highly consolidated, there also is a tremendous amount of vertical and horizontal integration in the system, whereby in many cases, the PBM, the specialty pharmacy, um, the health plan, I'm sorry, the health plan, and, um, and the, or, or regular retail pharmacy are all part of the same parent company. This is not my slide. This was a slide that was presented by Dr. Neeraj Sood from the USC Schaefer Center at an NAIC call in August. I draw your attention to the last bullet point. He talks about the consolidation that's in the marketplace, but he says that of the hundred of hundred dollars spent on drugs, forty-two dollars goes to PBMs, wholesalers, pharmacies, and insurers. So again, not a pharma study. This is an independently that it's done. Essentially, what it's saying is that drug spending overall in the country is not a large share of overall healthcare spend. Brand manufacturers, what they retained, at least in 2015 is the last data that I have, accounted for about 7% of total U.S. healthcare spending. The United States spends about four and a half times that amount on hospitals. Now the, now the two and a half before, that 7% of healthcare spending is after rebates and discounts have been accounted for. Four and a half times more than that is by hospitals. Over a third of U.S. healthcare spending is on, it's on hospital spending, that, that is there. This is important because when an employer comes to you and says, you know, 20% of my healthcare spend is on drugs, well, that, or prescription medicines, what Dr. Sud is saying is that almost half of that amount isn't going to a brand or generic manufacturer, it's going to somebody else in that, in that overall supply chain, which we feel is, is something that needs to be addressed and to be able to reduce the amount that patients have to pay for their medicines. And finally, I know I'm in the interest of time, this is, these are some more proactive solutions which we feel that, that could be taken in states to, to increase the affordability of medicines for patients who are trying to, to get access to these life-saving uh, cures. I don't disagree with some of those. I have two quick questions, sure. uh, Mr. Commissioner. So um, my first question is, and it might almost be better directed at DCBS than it is at Mr. Samuel, but, um, Shouldn't rebates that insurance companies get from drug manufacturers or PBMs, shouldn't that eventually be reflected in the rates that they charge the payers? <clears throat> like, I, it feel, you know, I don't like this coupon system because I think it just makes everything look super cloudy and I can't understand what's really going on, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but you explained it very well. But shouldn't that discount eventually show up in what I pay in premium? Now, if the, it's what, being calculated properly, what insurers are saying, insurers say that 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 these rebates and discounts are used to keep premiums lower for all people who are covered. I have two issues with that statement. First issue is that this is not what insurance is for. <coughs> insurance is to spread risk. If I'm a person who's vulnerable and I need I need a particular medicine, there's very little in our overall healthcare system that people can afford without insurance. I mean, we spent $3.5 trillion on insurance, uh, on healthcare last year. There's very little in our system that you can afford without insurance. So the idea that an individual who is most vulnerable has to pay the highest amount is just fundamentally wrong. Second, thing, section, second issue that I have with that, that, second issue that I have with that is that money's fungible. So when someone says that I'm taking the money that I'm getting from these rebates and I'm putting it towards all 100% towards premiums, well, I worked for three health plan CFOs over nine years working on the insurance side as well. There's no just, there is no documentation that that is accurate. Part of it could well be done to keep premiums lower. Other part, that money could also be used for other things. 
there's no such thing as like, you know, orange money or blue money or green money that I'm going to use it just for this one particular purpose. It goes into a pot. Sure. And then that money is then right. used for any number of different things. So there's no way to say definitively that all of those $166 billion has gone for premium reduction. <clears throat> but patients need to be protected. They are having to pay way too much for the cost of their medicines, and this is hurting our overall system. Because when patients have to pay too much for their medicines, they don't take their medicines. It affects adherence. And how much they have to pay is a direct reflection of insurance benefit design. Mm -hmm. Insurance benefit design determines how much they have to pay, not the list price of a drug. All right. So I'm basically saying is that they, they need to be able to be protected so that they're able to afford their drugs, so they take the medicines their doctor intended, and that will improve adherence and then reduce unwanted things like emergency room visits and hospitalizations, which increase cost to the overall system. Okay, final question. And it may be that we need to have a more robust rate setting process in the state of Oregon so that rebates are part of our rate setting and not just fungible. Um, what do you think about my suggestion that we get rid of rebates? I, I, we Pharma supported the rebate, OIG rebate rule that came out this summer. It was pulled back, unfortunately. Okay. That, that rule would have passed 100% of rebates to patients at the point of sale. There's another bill out there right now in the, in the federal side. It's in the, it's in the Senate Health Committee. Section 306 of that bill requires all 100% of rebates and fees that are retained by, that are collected by middlemen in the system to be passed through not to the patient but to the final plan sponsor, to the employer or the, <coughs> um, or the health plan. That's an interesting idea. So the middlemen in the system would no longer be paid as a percent of the list price, but they'd just get a flat fee, for this, a fair market value flat fee for the services that they render. That's what PBMs used to be. That's what it used to be. This, they did, but that would, turn, that would make them agnostic, theoretically agnostic, to what the list price is. So they're not, they're not picking a drug based on how much money they will make on the drug. They're picking the drug which is the best drug, which is the most appropriate medicine for the patient. And that's something that maybe could be taken up on the state side, but that's something that, that you have to discuss in more detail. Um, so a question, but Representative, no, the um, uh, health insurers in Oregon do account for rebates received. Oh. Uh, we, we look at that. The, the department looks at that during the rate review process, and it currently, it varies per insurer, but it's about a 2 to 3 percent reduction in premiums based, uh, on, the based on the rebates received. So uh, a question for you, Samil, on this last slide, bottom left box, you talk about uh, certain medicines uh, getting first dollar coverage. Uh, can you elaborate which medicines that would, those would be? I mean, they could be for chronic diseases for the most part. I mean, we spend a ton of our money, like over about 90% of healthcare spending is in one way or another to treat chronic disease. And so there's, there's medicines that could, doesn't have to be, yeah. even doesn't even have to be a brand medicine. It also could be a generic medicine um, that people need that, that you would end up having, if you were to look at the overall system, how much the, how much the patient's having to spend for the medicine and how much the savings would be on the back end if they actually were able to take it and have high adherence levels. There's analyses that have been done on this which we could share with you. Um, IMS did a study a while back which said that if people took their medicines the way their doctors intended them to, that the savings to the system was about $213 billion a year. But they don't take them, the, the adherence levels are lower oftentimes because the out-of-pocket cost that they're required to pay for them is just too high. Okay. So one more question, we might come back after everyone else, but one more question. Thank you for your presentation. We received questions from the public, and I wanted to share one uh, for your response. Um, why are the costs so high for some medications that have been on the market for years, especially life-saving drugs like insulin? Insulin, like I said, the list prices are high. The net <clears throat> prices are a lot, lot lower. That's why we, we believe that those rebates and discounts that manufacturers are paying should be passed on to the, to the consumer. Now, keep in mind that the reason why manufacturers pay rebates in the first place is to get access on insurer formularies. If, a, if an insurer covers 80 million or 90 million people and you're not on that formulary, that's pretty devastating for a company, All right? So you're trying to get onto that particular formulary and you're, and you're, providing, a, you're providing discounts to make the financial situation uh, tenable enough for the insurer to cover your product. One of the things that, that Representative Nose asks is, well, why just get rid of rebates? So if all four of you guys had brand products, all had similar list prices, all had big rebates, all had similar net prices, but Representative No said, you know what, I'm not gonna play this game anymore. I wanna drop- Apparently I have to, but- Right, but say, <laughs> say, I drop, say I drop the list price, all right? Now everybody in that system makes less money on his drug than they do on yours. 
Are they, are they just going to say, hey, that's okay. I'll just take less money and that'll be fine. Probably not. What they're most likely going to say is, you know what, I like your drugs better than his. And your drugs are going to get the better formulary position. I'm making less on yours. This may not, you may have trouble getting formulary access. You lose access to 80 or 90 million people in the country. One, you'll be looking for a job if you're a person doing contracting. And two, you, that, that's going to be pretty devastating for the financial bottom line of that company. Thank you. Just to clarify, so the the um, the price concessions that you're speaking to and the impact on price, are you saying then those are specific year over year increases? Those charts we were seeing before, when a, a drug's been on the market, those pressures will continue edging that price up over time continually. What typical? Yes. What typically happens is list prices continuously. You, you see, start seeing increases over time, but the rebating increases over time too as you have more competition. That's how competition works in our country, in our, in our system. 90% of all medicines utilized in the United States are for generics. Every one of those generics used to be a brand. Right. And that's a built-in cost containment that for prescription medicines have in our system that does not exist anywhere else in the healthcare system that we have today. Thank you. Thank you, Samil. So let's move on to the second presenter. I believe, Bill, that's you. Uh, good evening. My name is Bill Head, uh, Senior Director of Government Affairs with the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, which is the PBM Trade Association. PBMs administer the prescription drug benefit for 266 million Americans across uh, government plans, private plans, Medicare, Medicaid, Union Trust, et cetera. Uh, PBMs are projected to say pay her $650 billion over the next 10 years. Um, I feel compelled to respond on the rebate points made. I'm not sure I really learned a lot about the pharmaceutical manufacturer role in the supply chain, but I did learn on the opinions of the uh, pharmaceutical industry with respect to my industry and, uh, and others, so I, I feel compelled to respond to that. Rebates exist throughout the supply chain. They're not unique to PBMs and manufacturers. They exist between manufacturers and wholesalers who buy from the manufacturer and sell to the pharmacies. They exist between pharmacies and wholesalers who buy from the wholes pharmacies, buy from the wholesalers and sell to consumers. Um, but we tend to focus a lot on the PBM because that is a, a big piece of it, and I appreciate that. We view P uh, rebates really as the only way to exert any kind of pressure, downward pressure, on pharmaceutical manufacturers to make the price more affordable for the purchaser. When the rebate rule come out, came out that was mentioned, we made, that was our, the crux of our comment. But we also said if you are compelled to want to do it on a you know, consumer level, we'll make that work. But we think you're going to be throwing money away. And it's worth noting that the rebate rule was pulled, I think probably just a couple months before it was going to go into effect. And, and no small measure because the Congressional Budget Office scored it and their analysis was yes, some consumers, some Medicare beneficiaries will experience lower costs for prescriptions but every beneficiary will have higher premiums if we, if we do it this way, if you just pass the, the rebate on to consumers, to the tune of $177 billion over 10 years. So they pulled the rule. Um, it, and I, I, the gentleman made this point too, 90% of drug suspense are generic, 10% are brand. Of that 10%, maybe, and I'll defer to you, but I think four to 6% are rebate eligible, and by that I mean there's a competitive therapeutic equivalent that you can play off of sure. off of each other. Um, I will note that the example uh, Cassie gave on Linvima, um, I'm willing to bet if you track the increases, they were, it was originally pr approved as a, to treat thyroid cancer, um, and then kidney cancer, and then lastly, I think liver cancer. Uh, and in each approval process, they did not have a competitor. So you look at the brands that don't have rebates and don't have competition, those prices increase, you know, without any restraint what's whatsoever. Um, and this isn't just us saying this. In 2018, the Office of Inspector General at HHS did a study and say after accounting for rebates, drugs prices went up. In other words, it, we weren't the cause of the price increase. That despite rebates or after accounting for rebates, they still increased significantly. And then just a couple of months ago, uh, the GAO did a report, and, and, and this is something that don't get stocked a lot. In the commercial market, about 95% of our rebates are passed through to the payer. And the payer always decides what they want to do. They can have 
They can they determine what they want to what percentage they want and then what they want to do with it. That's the payers, the purchasers prerogative to do. But in Medicare, uh, GAO found that 99.6 percent of rebates were passed through to the Part D plans. And I think if you if you look and not that it's a perfect market, but Part D plan sponsors have been able to keep premiums relatively stable in in that market. Um, I mentioned the uh, the rule. If it, you know, if you can mandate that you know we pass it through, whatever you want to do, but we really want some. You know, other than pharma saying it, that's the reason for their price increases, we have three government agencies, separate government agencies, saying that rebates aren't the problem. Um, and I think the ev the, the evidence is is there. Um, I will. I do want to cite the one example that was given. Um, on the rebate for the individual buying the insulin, rebates aren't done on an individual basis, and they aren't done at the time of the transaction. It's often uh, at least a quarter, a couple of quarters, sometimes a year before the rebate's actually processed and given back to the purchase or get passed on to the purchaser. So it's not a, it, we don't currently have a point of sale rebate for the patient or for the, for the purchaser. It just doesn't, it doesn't work on that basis. So you can give an individual a high deductible plan, and yes, the plan is benefiting, but then they have beneficiaries who have a five dollar copay, and the plan is paying more for that individual. So it, 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 you can't you can't pull out an individual and say um, that it works this way. Uh, PBMI, which is an ind independent organization that looks at pharmaceutical issues, broke down the the, the dollar this way: sixty five percent of the pharma pharmaceutical dollar goes to pharma pharmaceutical manufacturers, twenty five percent goes to pharmacies. 6% goes to PBMs, and 4% goes to wholesalers. Um, I do want to make one final comment on transparency. We absolutely support transparency, but we want demonstrable transparency that benefits the patient. And you may be aware that CMS has come out and they are proposing a um, requirement on Part D plans to have real-time benefit tools available to beneficiaries beginning in 2021. That means that when a patient is in the doctor's office, they have all the access to the formulary, their plan design, their benefits, and the doctor and the patient can make the most informed decision about what's the best drug for that patient at that time. And if there's an appeal necessary, if the drug that the doctor wanna prescribe is at a, a higher copay, they can do it on site. And that way the patient isn't going to the pharmaceutical <coughs> counter and getting, excuse me, getting sticker shock. So we do support transparency, but something that results, <coughs> excuse me, that results in the patient helping the payer and the patient uh, at the counter. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to <coughs> maybe let the last two panelists talk just to make sure everyone has an opportunity to speak, and then we can ask some more questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mihir Patel. I'm a VP of Pharmacy uh, at Pacific Source Health Plans. Uh, we're a regional nonprofit health plan started about 85 years ago in Lane County. And just want to give uh, our perspective on basically how uh, drugs are added to the formula and how that process works and really what how members' cost share works. Uh, so uh, the way drugs are added to a formulary that, or the list of covered drugs is really through our pharmacy and therapeutics process, which is really an independent uh, committee set up by the health plan composed of independent uh, practicing physicians and, and pharmacists that come together on a monthly basis, at least, within our health plan to help review drugs uh, and look at its clinical effectiveness as well as cost effectiveness uh, to help decide whether a drug should be added to the formulary or not. Um, they also help review and establish what the clinical criteria protocols should be, if there's any utilization management protocols that should be in place to ensure uh, drugs are used properly. Um, as a health plan, it's, uh, we, we are the stewards of our uh, members' dollars to make sure that they're getting the best bang for their buck in terms of coverage, as well as cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness of health care. Um, in addition, uh, our P&T committee also uh, helps ensure that uh, when new drugs are released out to the market, um, they're looking at those drugs on a timely basis to compare the effectiveness of those new agents compared to older, older drugs in the market to help decide whether those new drugs should be added and at what tier. And so uh, we use uh, different tiers on the formula to help really incentivize utilization of the lowest um, and mo lowest cost and most cost effective drugs. And typically drugs on tier one are usually generic drugs. Tier two are, are usually preferred brands. Tier three are really uh, more of the higher cost brands and so on and so forth. Um, in addition, um, how 
beneficiaries actually, uh, their cost share really is defined by the type of plan design that they have signed up for, whether they've signed up for it through an individual plan where they have full exposure to what those different plan designs are and full options to decide what uh, works best for them and their families or whether it's through their employer or if they're covered through uh, Medicaid or Medicare, uh, those different plan designs also would apply to the member and those different cost shares would apply. Happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. We'll come back to that in a, in a second. Uh, Ms. Martin. Hi, um, my name is Tammy Martin. I'm with Oregon Family to Family Health Information Center. It's a grant program funded through the Affordable Care Act. Every uh, nation, it's every state in the nation has a Family to Family Health Information Center. Um, Oregon's is housed at Oregon Health Sciences University. And we are unique in that we are staffed by family members that have either a family member experiencing a disability or a complex medical health condition. So we uh, help, uh, it's a no cost to the public from zero to age 25, help people and families navigate these complex health, complex health systems. Some of the things we do is help parents um, appeal insurance denials, um, find funding for durable medical equipment if, or payer of last request. Um, every time they are, come up against a wall, they have a number they can call. Um, sometimes it's just as simple as sitting down and helping to fill out a form because that's the hurdle for the family to get through. Um, I am a parent of a 12-year-old who experiences Down syndrome and he also is on the autism spectrum and is medically complex. So from the parent perspective and the family perspective, that's our voice here in Oregon. Um, and a story that I would share is from a young woman who experiences fibromyalgia, migraines, um, mental health conditions, and now <coughs> PTSD. Um, she did pretty well until she was 25 and then no longer was covered under her parents' health insurance policy. She got a job that had health insurance, but when she lost it, um, it was very challenging for her um, because of her medications. Um, Lamictal was the most important. Um, she said that uh, at the time she lost her job, it cost $1,500 for a 30 months supply, a 30 day supply, excuse me. Um, so lack of access to her meds um, eventually led to mental health crisis, inpatient hospitalizations. Um, at both points, the system still didn't help support her, sustain her. She became homeless and um, in the trauma increased. Uh, her answer, her solution was uh, she was able to apply disability services. And at that point, um, within seven months, she was receiving disability and had help starting to put back the medications that she needed um, to deal with the muscle pains from the fibromyalgia, um, the med mental health related, um, as well as uh, migraines. So currently, as she sits now, she has 15 medications a month that she, that she uses. Um, five of these require the doctor to send the insurance company a prior off paper each month for her to fill it. Um, I have the list if you want the names. I don't know that I would be able to say them, but I can try. <laughs> um, she currently can't get access to Relpax for her migraines. Um, so she has to get a monthly shot, but she has nothing to help her with breakthrough migraines. And um, on the average, I asked her, so in a year's time, every month, how many times do your meds not refill on time, right? So she figured on an average that every month at least six weren't filled before they ran out. And this woman also doesn't drive. So she, and I'll leave you with her quote, we need more care and affordable meds with less complication to access. Why must it be a crisis before care model? where people must experience trauma or desperation before they can get what they need from a doctor or medication. So we're out there on the ground running, helping families navigate these complex systems. Thank, thank you, Ms. Martin. You're welcome. Any questions, please? I do, thank you. Um, Bill, maybe you can help clarify something. I've been trying to figure out during my time on the task force um, the last year and in, uh, during the 19 session, um, I'm just trying to understand if PBMs are paid a percentage on the, no, the uh, no, negotiated wholesale acquisition price. What motivation is there for PBMs to keep the price down? It, because it's not our money, it's the, it's the payers. So in the contract, the payer will determine what they want to spend and it's their money. So they can, they can pay us a, 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 a flat fee 
they can do it on a percentage of um, you know the rebate, however they want to structure it fi financially, but it's the purchaser's money at the end of the day, if that makes sense. Okay. And I think you answered the, my my next question is so the rebate is considered as part of the negotiation for the WAC price. Well, we don't we don't we won't deal with WAC. We'll do AWP in terms of how we would negotiate okay. with the plan in the pharmacy, but we don't, we won't deal in whack. Okay. Because we don't, we don't buy and sell drugs. Does that answer? As clear as I've been able to get <laughs> over the last two years. Dr. Sophie, my question's for Mr. Patel. Sure. So I, um, I followed your presentation about what it is that you do when to encourage patients to use generics and more cost drugs. What is it that your business does to be able to, what tools do you have to negotiate a better price from the manufacturer? Yeah, so our, our hands are kind of tied as, as others have mentioned. We don't set the price, right? The manufacturers set, set the list price. And so uh, we work with, we work with many. You refuse to pay, right? You could say, no, I'm gonna use another drug. Well, yeah, absolutely. We can, and that's, class. Our, our, our only really tactic is really around formulary design, right? And to ensure we have the most cost-effective drugs on our formulary. And so we also work with PBMs to help negotiate uh, really aggressive rates with our retail partners, right? So the pharmacies that are actually dispensing the drugs, um, we work with our PBMs to hold them accountable to ensure that the reimbursement rates are set appropriately uh, at the pharmacy level. Um, but in terms of being able to control the, the, the price, um, we, we unfortunately don't have that control since the, the, the list prices are, are what the manufacturers come up with. So, Mr. Patel, I'm going to ask you a question we received from the public. Uh, why do insurance companies stop covering drugs? Why do they get to choose what medications are allowable regardless of what a doctor prescribes? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, you know, we try to ensure that patients aren't stopped on any type of therapy that they're continuing on. So we have continuity of care protocols and, and uh, guidelines in place to ensure patients are able to continue therapy if, if that treatment works. Um, there's multiple reasons why a drug may be moved off a of formulary or even changed on, on formulary positioning. Whether it's new competition that comes out, uh, a drug actually could be shown as uh, less effective. Uh, it could be another new agent that comes out that shows more effectiveness. Uh, there's even older drugs, that, drugs that have been on the market that have shown to... This is ending now. As requested by the host, please hang up. <laughs> there are also older drugs that have been on the market for quite a few years that now have come out with studies that saying that it could actually be harmful. And so... Um, you know, as I mentioned before, our p and committee actually evaluates that information on a monthly basis to ensure that we're providing the most cost-effective and safest medications on the market. Mr. Pena has been trying to say something. I quickly, just one small point. Uh, it was brought up about the rebate rule when it was pulled back, that it was because it was a high CBO score, like $177 billion over 10 years. The reason for that score was we didn't agree with the methodology. They, they don't use dynamic scoring. They use a very static scoring formulary uh, right. approach. But Part D is a, is a, only covers prescription medicines. All right. So what they're basically saying the money's got to come from somewhere. So if you, if you send those rebates to the patient, it doesn't go to the plan sponsor. It increases the plan sponsor's cost. But the denominator is only prescription drug spending. In a broader market, with regard to the commercial uh, market, United Healthcare about a year ago Made, made an announcement that for their fully insured business, they were gonna pass 80% of the rebate through to the patient at the point of sale. And I was there when they made the announcement, it was at a PCMA forum, and they basically, and the word that was used was, the effect on premiums was, the word was negligible. Because you're spreading out risk over a wide variety of healthcare services in the broader market. Whereas in Part D, it's only limited to prescription drugs. So the, as a percent of the overall spend, it's a very small amount that it would cost to, to alleviate a lot of the burden on patients across an entire marketplace mm -hmm. than it would be only if you're limiting it to a prescription drug benefit. Thank you, Sunil. So I think next year we're gonna have to make this a half day hearing to fit in everything uh, <laughs> that we need, but uh, I wanna thank the, the four of you uh, for your comments uh, and uh, as we move on, we have one final presentation from Dr. Hartung. And thank you, Representative Nose. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> it was a good presentation, all four of you. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
you shaved. You recognize her. Doctor, th thank you very much for joining us. Please just introduce yourself and go right ahead. Great. Um, I'm pleased to be here tonight. Um, my name is Dan Hartong. I'm an associate professor in the College of Pharmacy at Oregon State University. And uh, the focus of my research has been prescription drug policy. And I was asked to come here tonight and talk about my work related to the high cost of drugs for multiple sclerosis, which is something I've been working, thinking about for the last five or six years with uh, neurologists and other researchers at Oregon State and Oregon Health Science University. So although the information I'm presenting here specifically relates to MS, similar patterns and adverse consequences have been observed for other uh, therapeutic classes that you guys have discussed tonight. Um, <clears throat> some disclosures about myself. Um, as just as a way of introduction, multiple sclerosis is a progressive immune-mediated neurologic condition associated with significant physical dis disability and functional impairment. Some recent figures suggest that over a million individuals in America have MS and the economic burden is significant. Per patient, it's about $70,000 per year. And contrary to kind of just overall drug spend, about within the, this patient group, about 50% of the spend is directly re related to their prescription drugs. Uh, MS disease modifying therapy, which is a cornerstone of treatment, is not curative but can reduce relapses and delay progression. And most national and international practice guidelines recommends that DMTs should be offered for all individuals with relapsing forms of MS, which is the most common type of MS. So the first DMT approved for MS was approved over 25 years ago in 1993. It's called beta -Ceron. Um Currently, there are over 19 drugs that are approved for MS on the market today, and they vary pretty dramatically in mechanisms of action, routes of administration, efficacy, and side effect profile. In the first 15 years since beta seron was approved, primary therapies were either interferon-based or glitiramir. All were injections and had to be self-administered by patients. Um, there's a three DMTs that are infused but are not used typically because of some tolerability issues. Uh, in 2010, the first oral agents were approved, and shortly after, two other oral agents uh, were approved. Um, and most recently, in 2019, there have been three approvals of three additional uh, oral drugs. One of the more important distinguishing features of this therapeutic class is that there have been no generics on the market until relatively recently, in 2015, on the first generic formulation of glitiramir or copaxone became available. Uh, this figure is produced by the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review and provides a nice qualitative summary of the comparative effectiveness for these, most of the drugs that are approved for MS. Um, and on this figure, you can see drugs that are more effective are listed further on the right x-axis and drugs that are safer are lift, listed higher on the y-axis. And so you can see that some of the infused therapies in green are among the most potent DMTs, but have issues with, with tolerability. Um, some of the interferons, which have been around for 20 years or longer, um, are less effective, but have a greater track record and, and are likely more safe. So thus, among these DMTs, there's great diversity with respect to mechanism of action, how they're administered, route, uh, tolerability, safety, and efficacy. However, um, one dimension that DMTs do not differ dramatically on is the tra trajectory of their price over time. And so this figure illustrates the change in the annual cost of therapy estimated from wholesale acquisition costs for all currently available therapies from the date they were introduced through the end of 2019. The black box at the bottom, the black line at the bottom, the dotted line, reflects the changes in price for beta seron, which is the first one that you'd expect just given inflation uh, for medical care, which is about 3% a year. Um, <clears throat> the numbers in the gray area indicate the median annual change in price corresponding to the gray area in that timeline. So you can, as you can see, in the first uh, five or six years after the approval of beta seron, there was essentially very little change in the annual price um, as more as a few other agents came on the market until about 2002, 
Uh, when the first new interferon product was released, Rebif, after that, from 2002 to 2014, median prices increased about 15% per year, and then moderated a bit after 2015 uh, through 2018. And part of this moderation may be related to the release of some of the generic Latiromir products, which are in gray <clears throat> and kind of drop down there. Is, I'll show kind of a zoom in on this in a second. As of 2019, the median annual price uh, for DMT therapy is $87,000 per year. So here's just uh, kind of insets of this graph split up by three of the two ma the major categories, the interferons and the orals on the right. Uh, and so the, basically the same trends kind of hold within these two categories. I put glitiramir in the middle. Uh, so this is Copaxone, which has been the market leader for DMTs for quite a long time. Um, and you can see that, indeed, that the release of a generic product in the, within this particular drug um, did seem to moderate the price increases for the branded versions of the drug after in 2014 or 2015, and then in 2017, another version, generic version, was released. So um, <clears throat> drugs for MS are one of the most expensive classes of drugs for many payers. Uh, because many with MS will become disabled and ultimately qualify for Medicare, costs for this program are particularly high and rapid, rapidly rising. So this is from some recent work in JAMA Neurology, so, which found that between 2006 and 2016, spending in the Medicare Part D program increased tenfold during this period and out-of-pocket costs for patients increased sevenfold for patients using these DMT agents. In 2017, the Medicare program spent over $5 billion for 11 self-administered DMTs and nearly $1.5 billion for just branded versions of glitiramir. And so to put these numbers into context, in 2016, Medicare paid approximately $1.4 to, to all neurologists in the Medi who serve patients in the Medicare program. So thus, Medicare is spending more than three times, three times more on DMTs for this single, or for four DMTs than for all neurologists that care for patients uh, who use DMTs. So the high and rising prices negatively affect patients in at least two ways. First, expensive medications are often subject to utilization constraints, such as prior authorizations and step therapy which require patients and neurologists to provide justification or fail certain therapies in order to be authorized to use other medications that may be preferred for that particular patient. And these administrative hurdles can often, often delay and disrupt therapy. So in this paper we published earlier this year, we found that in the Medicare Part D plans, that prior authorization policies increased um, from about 62 to 65 percent of plans in 2007 to about 77 to 80 percent of plans in 2000. 16. The other major way that high prices of, can affect patients is in out-of-pocket costs. So under Part D, out-of-pocket costs are incurred year-round in four sequential phases, the deductible, coverage phase, the donut hole, the coverage gap, and then catastrophic coverage. Importantly, cost sharing for many of these drugs is directly based on undiscounted list price. So in the same paper, we reported that out-of-pocket for patients using a DMT was about $6,000 a year, and actually highest for the first initial months when, when patients went through the coverage gap, essentially, and then made it through the other side to get to the catastrophic coverage um, portion of their benefit. Importantly, also importantly, there is no current cap on out-of-pocket costs for Part D beneficiaries, and patients continue to pay 5% throughout the year, so there's no cap. So historically, this is no, you can't see this, but historically patients' largest out-of-pocket costs occurred during the coverage gap or the donut hole, where they paid 100% of drug costs until reaching catastrophic co coverage. To alleviate this important financial burden for patients, provisions of the Affordable Care Act and some later legislation gradually closed the coverage gap by reducing out-of-pocket liability from 100% essentially in 2010 to 25% in 2019. And some other work that we're working on, um, We've, we've found that because DMT prices also increased during the same period by about 2.5 fold, that actually closure of the coverage gap, which should have had helped patients in terms of reducing their out-of-pocket exposure, 
um, had very little effect on their actual out-of-pocket costs, which remained essentially unchanged from 2010 to 2019. And we did some simulations and found that if DMT prices had remained unchanged or only increased at 3% a year, closing this coverage gap would have reduced out-of-pocket costs by um, a couple thousand dollars or about a third, um, which is shown in the, the blue um, columns here. Thus, we, we conclude that escalating prices have largely undermined the policy intent of the Affordable Care Act in closing the Part D donut hole. So I'm gonna skip this for time and just close with a couple other comments. <clears throat> so in closing, um, similar to other drugs in other categories, over the past 25 year, years, the cost of drugs for MS have spiraled upwards with both ever increasing launch costs and consistently large annual price increases. While the exact reasons for this are not clear, the simple explanation is, is that companies can raise prices because they, are, they need to maximize profits for their shareholders and for seeking financial growth for their companies. Um, for any particular product, the easiest way to do this is through price escalation. However, unlike other consumer goods, pharmaceutical companies are unconstrained by market forces that stabilize prices for other products. And this fundamental dysfunction is likely exacerbated by some of the things that we've discussed today, the opaque and convoluted web that connects manufacturers, payers, pharmacies, and wholesalers, and the PBMs to the distribution channels. So as I've highlighted with MS, is increasingly common with other conditions where biologics are used and branded drug companies often operate as monopolies that can increase prices with little recourse for payers and patients. So for MS, these monopolistic conditions have been intensified because of the relatively non-interchangeability and uniqueness of products in this space, as well as the relative lack of any downward pressure from any uh, generic uh, on the scene until at least 2015. So, and with that, I'll, I'll take some questions. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. And I, I think your last set of comments might have answered this question, but it, from the, some of the charts, it looked like somewhere around 2006 or 2008, the prices increased rather significantly from uh, how they'd been increasing pre, uh, before that. Right. Uh, any insight into that period of time and why that was? So, <clears throat> I mean, you know, I'll just flip back to this, the main picture here. So at 2015, you know, in addition to the release of a generic version of Copaxone, which it could have moderated potentially the trajectory of the other drugs, um, there's just been an increased scrutiny of companies um, since at least 2015 in, in, in like annual increases in, in price. And so it's probably a combination of both. Um, I think that one thing that, you know, that's contrary to other consumer products is that during this 2000 to 2014 period, you've had many, many agents come online and that, that's only just escalated the prices during this, this period, contrary to other kind of consumer products, so. What maybe I'll, we, uh, a question we got in from the public and you might not know the answer to this, but uh, wanna ask for the record at least. Uh, someone asked, why is my MS drug, Rebif, $7,800 per month in the U.S. and $9 per month in the U.K.? Uh, I mean, so there's two interesting points to that question. One is, is, is Rebif has been on the market since about 2002. Um, and so, you know, why does it, and it and at that point, it costs probably $20,000 a year. Uh, why does it cost $80,000 or $90,000 now versus 20,000 then? Um, it's unclear. Um, in terms of the UK, um, the UK sets prices and um, you know, dictates what drugs are going to be covered by the National Health Service. So they're basically price setters, essentially. Question? No, thank you. Thank you, doctor, very much. Thank you. So we're now gonna to move to the public comment portion of the public hearing. Uh, as stated at the beginning, we're gonna rotate around. Uh, my understanding is we have uh, one person in Medford who's uh, requested to offer some public comment. Uh, then we'll move to uh, the folks we have here who have signed up already. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll ask if everyone could please try to keep their comments to, to around two minutes. I would say, I would encourage everyone uh, to 
submit any written public comments to us at rx.prices at oregon.gov. Any comments that you submit in writing uh, will uh, be published on our website and incorporated. We are submitting a report to the legislature in December, uh, and any and all the comments we receive will be made part of that uh, report to the legislature. So we'll, we'll start with uh, uh, public comment in Medford, if that's ready. And maybe the, the first three up here, if you want to come up, will be Charles Erickson, Christopher Friend, and Lee Mercer. Hey, Kyle. We are live and ready to hear from the person who is in Medford. They actually are going to decline now. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Just let you know. Yep. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank, thank you, Kyle. Thank so you. We'll, we'll move on. So, uh, Mr. Erickson, please. Mr. Mr. Erickson, if you're ready, uh, go right ahead. I can hardly hear him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name's Charles Erickson. Uh, I'm a native Oregonian. I live on the South Coast. I didn't really didn't, we didn't get notice of this, so I didn't really get prepared real well. But uh, I want to start with... Uh, the pharmacies in our area, uh, particularly uh, Rite Aid, where if you don't have insurance, uh, I went in there and I bought some uh, Lamotrigine, a generic drug, and uh, the charge, they want to charge $406 for it. Um, with, I, I went ahead and uh, did some checking with Bymart, and they said, you know, you could use the... Uh, I don't know, good RX program, and the charge was $33. Uh, I also uh, connected with Coast Community Health, and they have a pharmacy there. Uh, they told me that uh, they charge $1 over, over their cost, and for that drug, a three-month supply is $22. There's something wrong, and I have, Rite Aid has been sued all over the United States, and so is Walmart for gouging people. You know, we don't gouge people during crises, you know, hurricanes or whatever. We don't do that, but we do it to the healthcare. It's, it's terrible. Um, a friend of mine in Newport, he wasn't able to come, Bill Lackner, and he's been on uh, Oregon Field Guide many times. Uh, he, he, he got a prescription for a skin cancer treatment, a cream, and the cheapest place he could find was Walmart. And he went back to his doctor, it was $251. He went back, he says, I can't afford it. His wife is working, he's 80 years old. His wife is working so, you know, they can get some sort of, she's got coverage. But uh, he went back to his doctor, he says, what can you do? And he said, well, I'll tell you what. There's a pharmacy in Longview, Washington, and he got it for 55 bucks. The, uh, Oregon is failing. We, we're failing the seniors, you know, and it's, this is long overdue. I, I thank you guys for at least trying. But uh, what's going on? It's dysfunctional. The doctor's right. This is a dif dysfunctional system that's not being addressed. I contacted and I, and I want to leave all of this information with you, but I contacted our attorney general over all this, and, I con and you know what, after I started gathering all this information, um, I contacted all of the attorney generals in the Western United States. The only place that didn't get back to me was Oregon. Jeff Merkley finally got back to me, and he's addressing it. But Oregon is failing. You're, it's failing us. And I'm, I'm surprised I wasn't even contacted to come to this because I have submitted so many complaints about this. It's not just me. It's all the seniors who don't have insurance or are outside of it for whatever reason, whether they haven't applied for it yet or whatever. But it's, it's hardly fair. It's hardly fair that... that, that we're allowing price gouging, and nothing's being done about it. And I, I contact the pharmacy board. Well, we can't do anything about pricing. I mean, I, I don't get it. 
I mean, why are, I don't get it. I, I mean, I think that's probably about all I need to say. Thank you very and much. I, can I give you this? Absolutely. Please do, yes. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move on, Mr. Friend. Yeah, good evening. My name is Christopher Friend. I'm the Oregon Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Uh, we're a membership-based organization with uh, over 8,000 members across the state of Oregon. Um, as the 4005 task force convened, Governor Brown addressed the task force by writing, transparency is an essential component of cost savings for the state as a, per excuse me, as a purchaser and for Oregonians as consumers and taxpayers, and ACS can, couldn't agree more. Um, when we're talking about drug pricing and drug affordability, um, it seems that this body and DCBS is studying the long-term costs and the supply chain, but there's things that policymakers in Oregon can do right now to help cancer patients. Uh, routinely, cancer patients and their caregivers that we represent are unable to budget or even predict the cost of their life-saving medications. Um, frequently, oncology therapies and prescriptions associated with a cancer diagnosis are subject to co-insurance rather than a fixed dollar copay. Um, while carriers will claim, and they did tonight, um, that a tiered formulary is designed to incentivize the use of a lower cost medication. Um, the reality is for the patients that ACS can represent, a lower cost medication is rarely available. Um, indeed, the greatest need for transparency around the cost of medications uh, is actually the, the true dollar cost of prescriptions subject to coinsurance. Not only is coinsurance a relatively new concept for many consumers in the healthcare environment, but especially those who are recently diagnosed um, with cancer. Uh, the cost sharing mechanism makes it nearly impossible for patients to anticipate their out-of-pocket costs and for patients to be able to uh, predict their uh, family's bottom line budget. Um, after all, if a patient doesn't have enough money at the pharmacy counter, they don't receive the prescriptions that they need, which keep them alive. Um, let's see here. Uh, over the last three years, ACS CAN and our patient advocacy partners have offered a number of policy solutions to increase transparency around coinsurance costs. Uh, those policy solutions have gone unanswered in the Oregon legislature and would just like to leave you with uh, one more reminder of Governor Brown's remarks. Consumer interest should be at the forefront of recommendations. Solutions that educate Oregon consumers about drug prices and help them manage their expenses are essential elements to cost containment. Oregonians are experiencing an ever-increasing copay and coinsurance. That's exactly what ACS CAN's policy perspectives have done. These policy solutions aren't groundbreaking. They've been passed in a number of states. California, Delaware, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, and Vermont. And the insurance commissioner in Colorado passed a bulletin which helps to provide more transparency and predictable costs for patients. Um, as uh, this group convenes uh, for future meetings, I encourage stakeholders to think about affordability of prescriptions and transparency so patients can anticipate their costs, save, and be able to afford those medications at the pharmacy counter. Thanks for the opportunity to testify this evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lee Mercer, uh, Insurance Commissioner Stolfi and Drug Price Transparency Group. I'm a former board president um, and current member of Healthcare for All Oregon. We're a statewide coalition of 120 member organizations, including unions, churches, community groups throughout the state. We have 15 chapters, and we have 36,000 people on our database, and that database grows by 600 to 800 people a month as we... Uh, reach out around the state and talk to people about building a universal health care system, and we hear from people around the state about how the health care system is too expensive and often how pharma is so expensive. Several of our people on our website have listed Lawrence from Manzanita, who struggles to pay for his much-needed prostate medication that is now eight times more expensive since he started taking the drug several years ago. Bill from Legrand, who's a good friend of mine, was told his prescription for a topical salve for low, salve for low cholesterol would cost him $800 for just one month. And Delta in McMinnville, who pays $900 out of pocket every month for her diabetes, high cholesterol, and antidepressant medications. Uh, the rest of my comments are, are here, are 
are in your hands. But I wanted to thank Representative Nost for the work group he did for a year. This is like deja vu, because it was in this room that for months we listened to the PBM folks, the insurance companies, and the pharma telling us that it's just too complicated to solve. And I'm glad, I want to thank you all for taking this on. You're making the first steps. If, if you remember Alexander the Great and the Gordian Knot, the complexity they're talking about looks like the Gordian Knot. And you are like Alexander here to cut this knot and figure out ways we can move forward to control drug prices in Oregon. Thank you for your work. Thank you. So next, uh, our final three, John Mullen, Mira Hack, and Courtney Holstein. When you're ready. Hello, commissioners and members. Uh, for the record, John Mullen. I'm here on behalf of AARP and also on behalf of the Oregon Coalition for Affordable Prescriptions. I, I realize that this is the end of a long day and there's not a lot of time to talk, but I wanted to talk about the distinction, first of all, about AARP and OCAP. Um, AARP is engaged with OCAP, uh, but because of national restrictions, AARP cannot join organizations. So as some of you know, I was lobbying for on behalf of ARP during the session and I'm now continuing to work as a volunteer. Um, just a couple of things that I'll say about AARP in, uh, in interest of time. There's an ad running on television that AARP produced and uh, the spokesperson says, um, prescriptions don't work if you can't afford to take them. And that's an obvious statement. Uh, in the midst of all of the complexities that are being discussed tonight, it comes down to issues about cost and transparency as far as AARP is concerned. Um, we have 510,000 members in the state of Oregon. So as you can imagine, we have heard a lot of individual stories from people uh, expressing their concerns about not being able to afford their medication. I'm just going to say just one in the interest of time. Uh, this is a common complaint. I've had to split my pills in half in order to afford them. This is Mark W. from Corvallis. Uh, there are a number of other stories, and I, I will submit something in writing. Uh, I'm going to move on to OCAP now. Um, today, uh, yesterday, actually, I was uh, installed as the new president for OCAP, and tonight I'm here before you talking to you about uh, concerns again about uh, transparency and cost. Um, OCAP, like AARP, has heard from many people through social media, through hearing stories from people from being out in the community. Um, many low-income Oregonians, including seniors, people of colors, and color, people of color, and individuals with disabilities, are simply going without the medications that they need. Um, and we all have heard information tonight about how manufacturers are raising uh, prices of drugs. And in, in addition, the DCBS initial information that we have that talks about the top 25 drugs and the increases that are pertained to those. Um, we're hopeful that uh, there will be additional steps taken by the Oregon legislature in 2020. Uh, OCAP uh, is coming back with another uh, bill about drug importation, uh, which we're hopeful will have a successful discussion at the state legislature this time around. In closing, I just want to say, again, I'll submit some comments, but um, in listening to all the testimony tonight, just really to leave you with the idea that drug cost and transparency are really important issues to Oregonians, and anything that you can do along those lines will be much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Insurance Commissioner Stolfi, my name is Myra Hawk. I live in Northeast Portland. I'm 32, and I have Crohn's disease. There are several medications that help alleviate my symptoms, and all of them have outrageous prices in the United States. Humira is the main prescription used to treat Crohn's. AbbVie, the maker of Humira, just raised the price an additional 9.7% in January. In the Department of Consumer and Business Services report, Humira is listed as the most costly drug and the drug contributing to the most increasing premiums in Oregon. My medical costs exceeded $300,000 before insurance last year when I took Humira injections. Now I'm no longer able to afford them. 
Now I take four pills a day of Lialda. That's 1,200 before insurance. I don't have the option of skipping a dose to save money because it would set me back further in my treatment. <coughs> I also do chemo monthly to keep my treatment, keep my symptoms at bay. Chemo causes an intense level of exhaustion, which makes it impossible to hold time, down a full-time job. It also deletes your immune system, so even if you do have a day job, you would call out sick all the time due to the germ exposure. The type of chemo I'm on costs $14,000 annually. It hasn't worked so far, so I'll eventually skip to a more expensive kind. In addition to these expensive, I also use three different creams for various complications that Crohn's causes. That's an extra 100 a month for all three. I often run out sooner. I'm well educated and, and, uh, <clears throat> and intellectually capable of having a career, but having this disease and having to spend so much money on treatment keeps me from meaningfully contributing to the economy through working or spending money. I shouldn't have to live like this at 32 years old. Yeah. These prescriptions cost pennies on the dollar in Canada. I understand that pharmaceutical companies need to make profits to make new medications, but this is out of control. Medications I need to survive shouldn't be completely unattainable to me. Manufacturers like AbbVie must be held accountable for price gouging Oregonians. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Um, right. um, thank you all. Uh, for the record, my name is Courtney Hellstein. And this evening, I am here on behalf of the Cascade AIDS Project and PRISM Health, um, which is our LGBTQ plus uh, primary care clinic in the Portland metro area. Um, and I know uh, I'm the last person, so I'm just going to get right to it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's my uh, clinic. Cut all the so. fluff. Um, so currently, um, Truvada is the only drug approved by the FDA to use as PrEP, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, Truvada comes with a yearly price tag in Oregon of over $20,000. Uh, likewise, for individuals living with HIV, the average annual cost for a year's course of treatment can exceed $39,000. Um, and just for reference, um, that is equal to about 65% of Oregon's annual, um, uh, annual median income. Uh, furthermore, um, because pharmaceutical manufacturers place such a high price tag on their medications, um, HIV prevention and treatment drugs are often subject to high coinsurance rates and utilization management programs, uh, which there's a lot of research that, lead, uh, that says that um, these types of programs lead to poor health health outcomes and higher rates of transmission. Um, to add insult to injury, um, uh, uh, PrEP is actually available in many provinces in, Can in Canada for about $250 a month, as opposed wow. to $1,700 in the United States. Um, and it's provided um, uh, for about $30 a month in Australia. Uh, so exorbitant drug um, costs often require Oregonians to make hard choices. Um, and this is really a lived reality for uh, several of the clients that we work with, including um, Luis and Kyle, who uh, struggle to pay close to $5,000 um, a year out of pocket for their medications. Um, it is really important to recognize um, that HIV uh, disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable in our communities, and transmission is on the rise among young people and women of color. Uh, so high prices can effectively block these groups from life-saving medications um, to underserved communities. So this is absolutely about health of our communities, but this is also about equity. Um, uh, and lastly, I just want to leave with one thing that uh, um, I didn't think I could be surprised anymore, but I was definitely shocked when I was looking at uh, DCBS's own um, uh, own reports of the of the information that you've all received through this program, and out of the top 25 most expensive drugs reported by insurers, four of them, four of them are for the prevention or treatment of HIV. Also, one of the drugs listed um, is for the treatment of Hep C, uh, which. Um, uh, for various high-risk populations um, for HIV, there is also a crossover um, of uh, Hep C diagnoses as well. Um, so uh, this is really important because um, people who are under a PrEP uh, regimen, um, they can live healthy lives completely unaffected um, by HIV. Um, uh, PrEP can reduce the rate of transmission up to 95%. Um, so we have the tools. <laughs> we have the tools to end HIV in Oregon, but prices set by the manufacturers just won't allow us to do so. So 
Um, thank you for your time, and uh, I hope that we can act urgent, urgently to, to address this issue for Oregonians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd, I'd like to thank all the panelists, all the presenters for, for joining us tonight, all those here in the audience, all those in Astoria, Medford, and Pendleton, uh, my fellow uh, moderators up here. Uh, you know, we want to encourage everyone here and listening to keep submitting your stories and your questions and your comments to us. We've received over 100 already as of tonight. Uh, as I said, all of this information will be included in a report that we submit to the legislature in December. Uh, all of that information will be critical to oh, help inform uh, the, these and other policymakers about what steps we can take going forward. Uh, so if you'd like to say anything or... Okay. No. Well, again, thank you all very much, uh, and I'll close this public hearing.